This will be very, very, very spoiler heavy of content that you do not have yet in the Western version of the game. Okay. Uh, all right. We right. Let's get started. Um, this is going to be like a like a one hour discussion. It'll be shorter than the previous lore arc, but there'll be a lot of little scenes that we could watch. Uh, again, many of which I picked out. Uh, a lot of them will be in English that I took from the Western client of the game, but some of them will be in Korean, and I'll explain what's going on in them if they are in Korean. Uh, so... Um, you don't have to worry too much. Uh, I mean, you can just enjoy the cutscene and I, I'll, I'll give you the deliberations afterwards. Uh, where we left off on the last episode of Lore Arc is we ended off in Eastern Lutera and the events leading up to Armin leaving uh, the adventure and joining Carmine, Carmine and, and presumably the, the demons and the Legion generals. And Armin betrays you guys after uh, Executor Solus and Sacria kill all the civilians and people that he was trying to protect uh, in what is pretty much a massacre. Um, and so Armin is gone now, and then Thyrain, he's kind of dismissive of the whole thing because Armin was a good friend of his. But he's like, okay, well, I understand you're looking for the arcs that are scattered across the other continents. Uh, travel to Crocanus shore, and then, um, you know, I'll charter a vessel for you, and then you can be on your merry way looking for the ark. So you're really leaving. I hope to travel too, once everything settles down here. To fight the demons, we'll need to unite all Arcasia. I shall seek out the Sidereals, and Armin must be found as well. Our quest is just getting started, my friend. May Regulus's light guide your path. Hail the hero of Lutera! Okay, so you kind of travel uh, northeast once you get there. And then normally, if, if if you're following like the actual progression of the game, you you would end up in Tortoik. I know a lot of people just straight up skipped Tortoik and Anika, but the game lends you to the idea that you're supposed to go to Tortoik. Um, when you go to Tortoik, uh, you meet a lot of people uh, like. The little Makokos, their their race of, of small people are actually called uh, the Makokos, even though they're not seeds themselves. But they're being terrorized by demons, and you eventually make your way to the heart of the giant, and you prove your strength to this big rock, who happens to be the entire island, actually. And then the giant gives you the second piece of the arc, and at the same time of you receiving that, uh, a voice reaches out to you, and then... You you hear someone greet themselves to you. I have waited a long time for you. A long time in the An ark bearer who will save the world. We'll meet again soon. And that's pretty much the you, you already get like your first arc like pretty early on into this. Uh but that's the first arc. Which makes me think, what happens if you like what happens if you skip that place altogether? I guess you do need the, the song at some point in time, but I imagine skipping Tortoise and then just not getting the arc and then just like big question marks with the story at that point. But anyways, you sail east, and then you travel to Annika, where you enter a martial arts tournament in order to get more information about the Ark, and you face off against the last challenger and the current Grandmaster, and he turns out to be in league with Vicus, who's one of the six Legion commanders in the Lord of Temptations. You eventually end up confronting Vicus, and she summons a really powerful demon, and the point of the demon that she summons is she wants to use it as like a body for Kazaros, 
Because Kazaros at this time is just a disembodied voice. Um, so the uh, Banda, the, the yin and yang boss, he's meant to be the vessel for Kazaros, but uh, in the end, you kind of kick his ass, and then you escape with Sidereal Way. And then afterwards, you discover a note from the late Sidereal, Xian, who is Wei's predecessor, and the former Sidereal uh, before him. And that, that basically reveals that the arc that you're seeking is on a different continent. It's basically Mario, the princess is in another castle. So you sail north, and then you arrive in the continent of Parthetine, and that's a place that's currently like rife with turmoil, because a whole faction emerges, angry at the continuous evolution of their kind, and automation of labor, getting rid of jobs for the common folk, K Kona. Heading into the city, you meet with the leaders Bastion and Sasha, who ask that you investigate a man named Kane, who created an intelligence-increasing drug with terrible side effects of aggression. And it's kind of revealed that Kane believes that humanity could evolve into a more advanced species collectively. And he finds this to be a necessity in order to protect Arthur Teen from a certain future that he foresees. And then after defeating his cohorts, you travel to Rise of Falls, and you go up the Verdant Tier, which is that tower where you fight his cohorts again for the second time. And it houses what's called the Genesis Sun, which is Kane's great creation. Uh, but upon defeating his subordinates and then Kane himself, you're rewarded with uh, another piece of the of the arc. Oh, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Kraus is his name. I saw it all. The prophecy of Septrum. Arthetine, swept away by the darkness. Even the gods could not defeat the demons. I knew then what I had to do. Create a new god. It's the only way to protect the city. My lovely, gray city, abandoned by the gods. But... I failed. The future is lost. That's some big despair energy. The eye of Skeptrum has watched over us Psychons as we've evolved in- Okay, I just had to make a point that this guy calls it Skeptrum, but everyone else calls it Septrum, which is a little weird. ...to the race you see today. Kraus was fond of saying the gods had abandoned us. But I believe the gods have not written us off just yet. This arc is the proof. So you get the the next arc uh, there, and from there you travel west and you head to North Vern, and that's where you discover the port is under attack by demons and undead, and a really powerful demon necromancer named Sigmund appears who actually kicks your ass, but then uh, you actually get white knighted by a dude named Thar. You... Sigmund, how are you here? You're dead. I watched you die. <sighs> Chaos has seen fit to return me to the world of the living. And I would ask you the same thing, Thar. So eager to resume our century-old battle. Patience, Garum. We need more time to prepare. Are you okay? Yeah, so he totally saves you, and then you kind of realize after, like, some story, 
Um, well, actually, before we get to that point, you make your way to the capital of Vern City. You meet with Aelin, who asks you to gather some forces to combat Sigmund. But uh, Aelin, uh, you ask her, basically, to, to help out. Hey, can you gather up this army to deal with this necromancer who's probably planning to attack Vern? But the queen, she doesn't care. Uh, or rather that she doesn't care. She's skeptical of the idea that uh, some bad dude from a hundred years ago came back to life. And she basically just says no, or go get some proof. Uh, so your trail takes you to eventually to ancient Elveria, where you learn that Thar had also been killed over a hundred years ago prior in his battle with Sigmund. Both of them were supposed to be dead over a hundred years ago uh but they both magically came back to life thar says that he came back to life around the same exact time that figment came back to life and he was like all right i'm gonna kick your ass round two even though he died a uh, hundred years prior uh but you do end up defeating sigmund and then you briefly come into contact with the spirit of vergris who tells you that the balance of light and dark is failing as the guardian's duty to, duty to usher the world into a state of birth <laughs> Why are you laughing, Sigmund? <laughs> you have failed. <laughs> yes, you disrupted my plans once again. <laughs> but this time, I already finished what I came here to do. The magic core is going critical. Chaos is inevitable. Embrace it. His great plan has already begun. If the magic core explodes, it will destroy Vern. There's nothing we can do. It's too late.
Okay, so that scene is actually uh, really important. Uh, so he utters that the player wishes to make a case for the continued existence of mankind, that they have to travel to the dreamless paradise, which we actually know now is called Elgatia, which is the homeland of the Lajneth, which is the continent that's releasing in Korea, actually this month. Uh, so finally, this bit of content from years ago is our destination this month. Uh, so you return to Aelin, and we'll, we'll, we're going to circle back to that cutscene because there's actually a lot of hidden messages in there uh, that's important for some of the theory crafting that we'll talk about later. But for now, you return to Aelin, who tells you that the Ark is not located on North Vern, but tips you uh, north to the continent of Shushire and gives you a ship that can kind of pierce through the ice shelf that's uh, blocking it off. Arriving at Shishire, you quickly learn that it's in terrible shape, people are impoverished, and slavery is commonplace, with civilians frequently being abducted. You meet with a rebel force that's trying to dismantle the slavery system by apprehending their leader, Brad, and tracking him down and defeating him and the demon that he was conspiring with, your trail takes you to the Maze of Mirrors, where you actually discover uh, a music producer named Akon, and you manage to, you know... Uh, deal with him accordingly. Such power, I can feel it. The taxing journey through this frozen wasteland was worthwhile after all. Regulus's bauble will give me all the life force power I need. I should have a new body, new flesh that shall never decay. So you still draw breath. That breath, that life, now belongs to a Khan, the Lord of Day. Come on, gaze upon the power of decay, more potent than darkness itself. Of course, you managed to defeat him accordingly, and then that leads to. to protect. Hero, the fate of the world now rests on your shoulders. You must protect the Ark, this gift of light bestowed upon the world by the gods. And that leads you to your next piece of the arc. You get you get the arc, and then you're just kind of chilling. And then um, after a bit of time, you meet with Aelin, and she pretty much tells you to sail west. So then finally you break uh, through the Prokyon Vale, and uh, you arrive in Rohendel. And it's the homeland of the Sylvain Magical Race, who we talked about in Lore Arc Part 1, is one of the original powerful races along with the Hal who are extinct and the Lazaneth who um, are most of them are in Algatia with the exception of a few of them. So you find that the content is maintained by four schools of magic. You meet the queen Azena who asks you to investigate the growing chaos within the continent. However, when you're speaking with the citizens of Rohendel, they're unable to notice anything is wrong, which you're able to deduce is due to illusory magic of some kind. And your investigation brings you face to face to face with Gurdia, the protector of the Flame School of Magic, who had been manipulated by Legion Commander Brelshaza. And then you kind of beat his ass down. Uh, you make your way to the Phantom Palace, where Brelshaza currently is, and you fight against her. And while you're unable to actually beat her, and she, she manages to get away, the Queen appears and she saves you. Uh, but Brelshaza manages to get the leave and just go home to Petrania. 
And Elzewin, the former great sage of the Sylvain, who they kind of stuck in a tree, um, he gives you the uh, he gives you the next piece of the arc. The sun retreats as the dusk breathes its last. What does that even mean? Night approaches for us all. We must make preparations to once again defeat the darkness. The light Rohendel has long protected will shine on the path you must now follow. All right, so you get the you get the next piece of the arc there. After that, you make your way south to the city of Yorn and quickly learn of the story of a mysterious sword-wielding hunchback. He's been murdering the Umar people. Uh, and stealing their souls. Mm, you make your way over to the Great Castle and you meet with the current King Kesar, as well as reunite with Sidereal Shandy and his old friend Balthor. And Balthor is the successor to a legendary blacksmith uh, and the former Sidereal Galator. So back then, there was a dwarf named Galator. His successor is a new. Uh, dwarf that you, you that you meet named Balthor. Balthor informs you that there have been issues that have disrupted the city's energy source. You head down to investigate. You find the hunchback that you heard about when you entered Yorn, and it reveals that they've been possessed by a sword who's been basically telling them to kill people so they can grow stronger. And you beat up the demon, and then the sword is abducted by a different demon who runs away with it, and you eventually learn that the sword was forged by two brothers of Galator, the former Sidereal, who were envious of his fortune and fame and created it from a stone that they had stolen from the primordial realm. They were like, they were like, screw Galator, we could make something better. It's a sibling envy, it's very normal. The stone itself housed the soul of a fallen demon by the name of Velcruz. In order to stop the sword from killing any more people and you travel to the primordial realm with Balthor and you meet with the souls of Galator's brothers, the people who made the sword in the first place. Uh, and they feel like shit when they hear that the thing that they made has been killing everyone. So they agree to atone for their sins by assisting you after you restore their strength and you head to the Ark of Arrogance and defeat the demon and the sword, however unaware. Carmine kind of sneaks in like a rat after you've won and he kind of reconstructs the sword, forcing it to bend to his will. Hmm. It's a shame. That you've never met a worthy master. <laughs> you dare try to consume me. <laughs> I like you. Let's spend some time together. Off to a curse land soaked in demon blood. <laughs> so, Carmine now has his hands on a really, really powerful weapon, Velcruz, and that's how he gets that big old sword that he swings around. Hmm, you're here! Everyone, listen up! 
The greatest masterpiece of Baldor just may be around the corner. As our ancestors said, it takes three things to craft truly legendary weapons. Three things? So, first! Good helpers, like us. <laughs> you can count on us, Cap. Second! Oh, good booze! And... The music of the forge! Ha! Shall we get started? I'm the first, turn up the heat Let the world in the hammer's beat It is built to seal our force defeat The hammer makes our hearts complete Silver or iron is not enough For KZMC, we are so tough Forge the steel, oh, day and night It is stronger than a lightning strike We can do it with skills passed down We will stay strong and never frown Never doubt, or we'll surely fail We will drink and tell the story Of a yarn that will live Throughout the lands Throughout the lands My masterpiece Legend here today! Cheers! Legend here today! One, 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 one! is back here with your gin in his hands. The true pride of your bills are great. Wherefore, is back again. Stop! Now, remember, great weapons should look great as well. It's all about the looks, that's true, it makes sense. I hope it works and doesn't break, oh, I meant no offense. Shut up! It's a work of art, no doubt, a romantic. Now come over here and join us, you, and bring over all your crew. We'll sing and dance to the rhythmic beat, to the hammer sound, and our bones Defeat. We'll sing and we'll dance and we'll tell of our stories, exciting adventures across the land. We'll sound across the land. May our anvils last till the moon. We'll be famous from shore to shore. You're done with the story and you're and there's the whole musical bit but now you sail north and you arrive in phaeton where you meet with uh the delane the avesta actually and you meet their leader grandmaster saika in your search for the ark saika allows you to leave and you just after they abducted you actually you were just walking around and then they put a they put a, a potato bag over your head and knocked you out with some drug and then you woke up in their hideout and you were like, I'm looking for the Ark. And he was like, oh, okay, you can leave. Avesta's goal is to close the demonic rift as you inquire with the denizens of the village and defeating a powerful demon, you actually end up joining them. That was their little test. They were like, go beat up this demon. You can join our, our org uh, and learn more about their inner workings. That's actually how you join uh, organizations in real life too, if you ever wanted to join an esports team. They are perceived as a villainous organization, but ultimately their purpose is really just misunderstood and they seek only good. It's weird. They, they're actually good people, but everyone thinks they're bad people because they look, well, bad. Grandmaster Psycho would later trade himself for the release of Delane children who were kidnapped by priests and paladins of Sacria who were led by a, a dude named 
Jederico. Uh, and working with the Avesta, you break into the Black Rain Fortress where they're keeping him captive. Okay, let, let's recap real fast because I got really confusing real fast. So you're with the Avesta. They want to get rid of the demons. And then some priests come and kidnap Delane children, like half demon people. And then they're like, what the hell? You can't just do this. So we break in. That was the stealth mission. You remember the stealth mission? And then we go face to face with Jederico and we're like, hey, can you not kidnap children? It's fucked up. And then they say no. And then uh, Saika's like, okay, well, you could have me if you get rid of the kids. And then Jederico's like, okay, that seems like a fair trade. So they take him and then we're like, okay, let's bust him out of jail now. So we go to the fortress and we bust Saika out of jail, but not before we actually learn from another demon that Saika is actually a full blown demon. But he's like, yeah, but do as I say, not as I do. And he's been harnessing the power of chaos in order to use his demon powers for good, since he says he can actually control them. Uh, a likely story, but we end up believing him nonetheless. In any case, he tells you to inform others of the impending battle that's going to take place underneath the red moon that's coming. And you actually go and meet with Jederico and you're like, hey, can you help us out? But he's like, no, I'm not going to help people that can join the bad, the bad side at any time. Uh, and he tells you to fuck off, politely. So the battle in the Black Rain Plains commences initially, and things are looking dire up until, for some reason, Jederico and the priests actually arrive to help out. Maybe they're not dicks after all. And they cast a giant barrier that helps out with the whole fight. But soon descends Feymine, who stretches out these dark tendrils that kind of wipe everyone out. Uh, <laughs> and it is, not, it is not looking so good when that happens. Side note, that's actually his Hell Mode Deathless title. It was already data mine, but if you can clear his Legion raid Deathless in Hell Mode, Master of Darkness. And of course, after the fight, or during that, Saika spearheads that like all all that dark tendril crap, and he kind of he kind of tanks it so that it doesn't kill anyone else. Uh, so, in a last ditch effort, Saika asks you to kill him while he still maintains part of his hu of his own humanity, uh, which you willingly oblige. And it's a pretty sad scene overall. We were born in the shadow. All my life, I was called a demon. I wonder, will I die as a human?
Devil Hunter cannot get let go of his guns, I swear to god. It ruins every scene. Anyways, you head back to Kalaja. A funeral service is held for those who had fallen in battle, including Saika. But a letter that he wrote to you uh, before the battle had taken place leads you to find the sixth piece of the Ark, Karta. And now at this point, we have six pieces of the Ark. Now we end up sailing to Punica and your vessel capsizes and kind of leaves you washed ashore. A mysterious woman rescues you, and you find up in a you wake up in a room dazed. Leaving the room, you ask the local island folk, and you've arrived in the island of Punica, and they're preparing for a grand festival. But a loud noise is heard off in the distance, and you find a girl named Nia being attacked by a weakened Keiko Sedon who is searching for something. And you're like, wait, how are you still here? And you know that part that bit was revealed uh, quite quite a while ago. Back when Carmine gave Keiko Sedon the suck after the events in East Lutera, he didn't actually manage to kill uh, Sedon because he before he, he before he was killed, he kind of installed his soul into the little doll that he's always carrying around with him. And he's searching for something. So Nia turns out to be the elder of the island who's unable to perform a song passed down by her descendants and is vital to protecting Punica. The townsfolk kind of look down on her as an unfit elder because of this. And with the presence of Keiko Sedona, a similar issue as what happened in the Borea domain back in East Lutera is now happening in Punica, where the local militia and the creatures are just kind of going mad. They're going ape shit and they're attacking everything around them. You do end up confronting Keiko Sedona and he manages to kind of hold on a hostage and that's Nia's close friend so Nia gives up the location of the the, the these special seeds uh that are basically the power and life force of Punica and so okay cool so don't he goes to absorb them and restore his uh vitality before he gets interrupted by Albion who he then infects with madness and turns into a raging beast and he's like okay you deal with this no. <laughs> I'm overflowing with power. <laughs> I don't like his voice. I'm sorry. Huh? <laughs> You're strong! I get it. That's... Albion, the Holy Beast. What is it saying? It's talking about Vergris. Stupid. What exactly about Vergris? You're stupid. Anyway, chaos will eventually... Well, if it won't be joining us, I guess we'll just be taking those seeds. <laughs> so yeah, um, at this point, hey, Kiko Sedon, he manages to get his... Uh, he, he, he gets his power back. Uh, and he manages to get away, and you defeat Albion, but Albion kind of runs off and goes on a rampage in Nia Village, and then Nia's able to actually sing the song somehow, because she remembers the lyrics are just the letter A, and uh, it, she calls the rage of the beast with the song, and then it's a happy ending. <laughs> A 
You can do this. <sighs> Nia! The light of love is deep have inside done it without me. your help. Give the best of you in all you do. You know, I so good when, when you're I think me. about it. I know I love you always. The goddess must have sent you the here to me. Scudere. My song is the voice of my love for you. Connected to the spirit <laughs> of the earth and the sky and the sea. We are must be there. May we cherish the memories we made together, living out our best life in thanks and humility. I love you truly. We'll always strive to reach the summit as long as we are together. I love you truly. May our love last forever from this day forevermore. My song is the voice of my love for you. Give my love to you always. Oh! <laughs> oh, here we go! The light of love is deep inside me. of love for you we are must be there
But then we get a little scene in a post quest uh, revealing something. What are we going to do now? Are we going back to Atrania? Maybe kill that weasel Carmine. <laughs> Joke's on him. What he absorbed was just a shell. It's a great prank. Let's see how long we can keep it going. Then what? We aim for something bigger. Bigger? Like what? Kazaros? Vergris? Come on, use your imagination. It's the quietest, maddest of all things. Maddest thing? Chaos. <laughs> Chaos mayhem. <laughs> so horribly you. <laughs> the scene is almost set. <laughs> the curtain for the big finale. <laughs> so we're gonna circle back to that in uh in a, in a little bit after after the after we're talking about the story because i think his role in the story is is pretty important um as to who his identity may be and what his actual motives might be as well but in any case after the events of punica you end up returning oh um this is actually a fair warning point. This is spoilers for content that you do not have yet. I'm going to start talking about South Vern here. So if you're trying to avoid those that stuff, you know, you, you just stop watching, I suppose. Uh, but if you're curious, it, it's a quick summation. Mm, I'm, we're going to go into it now. All right. Uh, you guys got your warning. So you return back to North Vern and you discover there's a political council that's begun to rebel against the queen, Aelin. And Aelin asks you to find her missing knight. Um, I think her name is Avel in the English version. She 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 went missing uh, because she got sent on a mission to South Vern to investigate stuff, but it pretty much radio silence. Uh, she hasn't heard back from Avel in a long time. The Adventurers Guild contracts you with a mage named Zarion who guides you to South Vern. And while searching for Avel, it becomes apparent that the rogue political faction has been kidnapping people and converting them into mind-controlled knights. Their true goal has been to conspire with the Legion generals to take down the magical barrier that's been protecting the continent. Managing to find Avel, you also rendezvous with old friend Thar and attempt to stop the council from taking down the barrier, but you're too late. As the barrier breaks, four of the Legion commanders, Thamine, Akon, Relshaza, and Vicus, descend onto the land alongside Carmine. Um, pretty much in a great stand uh, against the descending armies of Khazaros, Aelin and the Sidereals gather together a really powerful army combined with forces of all of the allies that you've met up until this point in every continent which actually you guys have seen in some of the Amazon Games trailers, and you're like, wait a second, this is future content that's not in our launch. And then this leads you to a face-to-face -face with the Legion commanders where you're able to fend them off briefly before having to make a quick escape. Uh, with a new plan to take down each of them, the battle against each individual general basically starts here.
그래, 분명 실패했다. 이곳에서는... 나는 보았다. 크라트르가 남긴 예언. 아르데타인이 어둠에 붕괴되는 것을. 이렇게 마른 카오스 게이트가 어떻게 하나가 될 준비가 끝난 거지 <웃음> 이제 혼돈 빛을 삼킬 것이다 오케이 okay. And so that is pretty much what sets the scene for this great conflict that is the battle against the Legion Generals. And you might have seen in that cutscene that only four of the Legion Generals were actually present. Because at this point in time, remember, Valton, he kind of got the suck back in East Lutera, so he is dead. And uh, Cook Satan, they also are presumed to be dead. Uh, because, you know, they're like, Valton's, I mean, uh, Cook Satan's dead, and then Carmine's like, yeah, he's dead, clueless, um, when he had given them the suck, but in reality, Carmine's the clueless one, because Keiko Sejun survived that whole ordeal, and now he's acting independently from everything else. So, your allies state that the key to victory at this point is to find the final piece of the Ark which rests in the dreamless paradise Elgatia, which again is our destination this month in Korea. We're going to be looking for the seventh arc, finally, after so long. So that is the end of the current like main story. There's the bit about Rowan, but we're, we're not going to go into that currently. Um, for now, we're actually going to talk a little bit about some uh some of the side things associated with this because now the story is kind of uh beginning to pick up again after we've been dealing with the individual legion commanders so some of you guys might be wondering how has Valton come back to life well the answer to that akon convict music music was so good the tunes brought him back to life so he came comes back as a ghost and fights as a minion of akon and then in the case of cook satan cook satan we're actually gonna talk about Luke Satan a little bit because I think his 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 story is pretty interesting uh so let's start with that look it cool Sedon who is he as we described in part one he's this unusual demon who kind of pestered Kazros until he was given command of the madness legion and while he was presumably killed by Carmine, he manages to survive by installing his soul into the doll okay cool the name okay cool Sedon refers to the doll the doll's name is Kate Cool, and then the unidentifiable demon, Satan. Um, so it's kind of like Kate Sith from the Final Fantasy series. The name isn't one thing, but it's two names. So he regenerates his powers through the seeds of Punica, and his true goal seems to be pretty ambiguous. While the other Legion commanders send out their underlings to battle the adventurer, Sedon instead invites them to the Midnight Circus, which is the raid that I've been getting my shit pushed in for the past week. 
which seems to feel like a test of the adventurer's growth. Um, and whereas the other Legion generals kind of send their minions to fight against you first, uh, Keiko Seidon himself, he kind of greets you in phase one and you're fighting against them from beginning to end. He doesn't have minions, he's there to test you in the Midnight Circus. And the battle ends with uh, his retreat, with him directly stating to the player that they shouldn't be arrogant, even though they've been growing and getting stronger, and that Keiko Seidon will be rooting for you, the player, from the sidelines as he just kind of exits without being defeated. Later on, Seidon actually rendezvous with a certain NPC named Ezerbet. You don't remember her? My fragrance seems to have no effect on you. I can sense a special aura on you. <laughs> You're here, so I assume you've seen everything. Oh, you better have. I gave them a pleasure unattainable in this reality. And in gratitude, they sacrificed themselves to me. I serve the primal beings old as creation itself. And as they shall soon take root in Arcasia. I have been accumulating the life force of this land. I can hear the primal beings whispers. Now that you're in my... This is a bug. There's supposed to be a fucking bloodborne creature here, but I guess in the room of memories you can't see it. Castle, you shall meet the same fate. Okay, but yes, like I said, he rendezvous with. Could <laughs> Credo <laughs> Okay, so obviously you, you've got no idea what they were saying, but well, we, we, we'll talk about it a little bit. So first of all, that scene opens up with him kind of walking down the corridor. This is actually right after the events of the Legion raid itself. He kind of just sort of got his ass whooped by you and he's kind of walking it off and he's like, wow, the adventure has really grown really strong in a pretty short amount of time while he's talking to um, Kekul himself. So they meet up with Ezerbet, and the very interesting thing about Ezerbet is, as we saw in the previous cutscene, we know that she serves the Primal Ones, and we have no idea who the Primal Ones are, but judging from how she greets Keiko Seidon as a noble one, it's actually implied that Keiko Seidon is one of the Primal Ones. He's one of the creatures of the beginning, one of the people that served Zazma and betrayed him when they turned over their faction to Hazaros. Yes, the ones from the beginning. Hey, Kul Seidon, though, he seems to have his own plan that is completely tangential to all the other characters in the story, and he doesn't seem to have a firm allegiance 
Uh, he's got a very winning resolve to even go after Kazuros or Vergris. He doesn't seem to really care who his enemies are. He's not loyal to Kazuros, and he's willing to go up against the likes of Vergris. And these are entities that basically represent order. Both Kazaros and Vergris represent order. Order in Petrania and order amongst the Guardians in order to keep the world stable. It's They're pretty much the antithesis of who Kekul Seidon is. So Kekul Seidon being one of the ones from the beginning, he might know more about the truth of the world. And there's a lot of clues in the game that suggest that there's a possibility that the world of Arcacia and its inevitable fate is a repeating one where the world leads to a certain fate and then resets back to the beginning. And that the adventurer's true objective is to break that cycle and to wake up from a nightmare. One of these clues might be, this, this, is, this is something that someone found, one of these clues might be implied by the battle against Kekul Seidon himself. In the final phase of Kekul Seidon, there on, on a bingo board, there is an enrage timer of 14 hours, 28 minutes, and 57 seconds. If you multiply this number by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, the number changes, but those individual 6 numbers don't, they don't change. It's 1, 4, 2, 8, 5, and 7 just rearranged differently. But if you multiply that number by 7, the number changes in its entirety to 999999. Nine, 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 nine. And there's this great emphasis on the number 7 throughout the game's story as the adventurer's journey to find the seventh and last arc in the current saga. So let's talk about the Lazaneth a little bit. The Lazaneth, they're people who betrayed the trust of Regulus, even though they were the favorite race of Regulus. They had their wings degenerated so that they would never take flight again, and they retreat to the domain of Elgatia, which is located right underneath the Divine World, and they just observe the fate of Arcacia, standing idly by even as the greatest threats endanger humanity. Elazaneth, they have this really firm belief that all things that occur are by the will of God, and that they should not intervene in the grand scheme of things. Beatrice is chosen as a Lazaneth who can spread her wings, and she's one of a kind in her race in every 1,000 years. But it is revealed that Nineveh, the sidereal, also possesses the power to an extent. She's able to also grow great wings, and Allegro, one of the fallen Lazaneth who lost his wings, finds it unusual that she possesses this ability as well. Nineveh, unlike the other Lazaneth of her kind who don't intervene, she stands by the adventurer and previously 500 years ago alongside Lutera during the Chain War and humanity to defy their destiny, as well as the, uh, she, she, she's, the she's the only one of her kind, pretty much, who's, who's working to try to break this uh, cycle. There seems to be something regarding the arcs themselves with details left behind by Lutera. And we're going to be traveling to Elgatia soon, and the director revealed that the capital city of Elgatia is called Arya Nerve. And there is the thought that the final arc will be located here, which would reveal the truth to the adventurer. We have the existing six arcs in the game that we've already obtained. There's Asta, the Ark of Trust, Elpon, no Elp, Ortus, the Ark of Creation, Agaton, the Ark of Prescience, Ratic, the Ark of Wisdom, and Karta, the Ark of Devotion. Each of those arcs that you collected, they do have a name. But if you take the first letter of each of those, you get A, E, O, a missing letter, A, R, K. With the implied final arc being from Arya Nerve, it is implied that this is the Ark of Nerve which would spell out Aeon Arc, the name of the original Arc, uh, a word that represents forever and looping, uh, eternity. This is something that the director himself said when he was talking about the final Arc. He, he actually ended up saying the word eternity a few times, put, putting quite a bit of emphasis uh, on, on it. And so a lot of people are really focused on this idea that the world of Lost Ark 
is a repeating history that happens over and over and over. And if that's not enough evidence for you, before Regulus was Regulus, his name was Lupion, which is the name of my Deadeye. Lupion. Lupion. In any case, Lutera, his will or memorandum says, hope will bloom from a prescient devotion and the wisdom of creation will be revealed by the trust forever. Lutera also describes his travels to Algatia as a pretty terrible place, but he also documents how he heard the songs of the Lazaneth, the Song of Valor, which you have learned. It was one of the first songs that you ever learned. Um, if you translate it into Korean, it's actually can be spelt the same way as Arya Nerf. And uh, that song may have come from there. And so when we travel to Elgatia, there's a good chance that we might actually potentially hear the Song of Valor again, maybe the original one. In the precursor of the adventurer's travels to Elgatia, we see a scene of Carmine speaking with an unidentified Lazaneth in an illusory space. This is the scene that just released in Korea just last week. Uh, and so we will quickly watch it. Hosangmani <laughs> 더 이상 개입하지 않는 게 좋을 것이다. 이번에는 반드시 지켜낼 테니까. 결심이 섰다니 다행입니다. 그래서 거짓된 운명을 위해 무엇을 걸었습니까? 운명이 당신 뜻대로만 흐르진 않을 것이다. <웃음> 이제 모든 것이 뒤틀리겠군. 이 낙원 너머에 진실을 마주하게 된다면 말이야. <웃음> 오케이. Okay. So, uh that scene is it doesn't say like a lot a lot because they speak in they speak in a lot of very vague phrases. Carmine, he kind of enters this space, and uh, when he approaches him, he approaches this Lazaneth, and he says, you know, uh, you know, there's a space where only illusions remain, so it's implied that this is a, an illusory place. And the Lazaneth says, it's not a place for, for you, even though it's just an illusion, only the truth remains in this space. Uh, and then Carmine responds to him saying that destiny is on the way and there's a chance for those who have fallen. And that can really, that could really mean a lot of things. It could be referring to the Lazaneth who had their wings clipped, or it could be referring even potentially to the Hal who were completely uh, vaporized, pretty much. The Lazanth responds that it would not, it would be better if Carmine were not to intervene any further, and he mutters that he'll definitely protect it this time. 
Carmine responds saying, I'm glad that you made a decision. And then he asks the Lazaneth, who we still don't know his name, what have you staked for a false fate? And the Lazaneth responds, everything. He, he staked everything for it. He says, remember, fate won't go your way to Carmine. And then he walks away. Carmine kind of mutters to himself as well. Now everything, you know, it'll be will be twisted if only if he could face the truth beyond this paradise so there there is some underlying story and uh i feel i really feel like the way they propped up the story to us obviously is just surface level uh and there's a lot more going on that wasn't revealed in the pre-game story that had been shown to us so far. The characteristics of the space that they've kind of meet in, they're very reminiscent of the Tabula Rasa found in Wisdom Isle. If you did the story in Wisdom Isle, you know that there's some freaky cube shit going on there and everything's all like funky and it looks like the cube dungeon and then it's implied that the cube dungeon is also uh, very similar as well. But it's also implied that this technology belonged to the Hal who's pretty much described as the smartest and most powerful race in the world at the time. They were the ones that were wiped out by Regulus after stealing Antares's Ark. And the Howl were the first to defy the will of Regulus and were subsequently rendered extinct. But there are some clues that are left behind in the world that may imply that not all of them were destroyed and some may have fled to another dimension using their technology. They're known for the ability to teleport and to warp. If their true intention was to not rule over the world, but to defy the fate set in motion by Regulus, the original story may have been warped to tell them as the villains of the primordial world. Some of these clothes are actually left behind by records that you can find in-game of a man who claims to be one of the Hal by the name of Bivrin Dare. And you can find some of these records in places like Wisdom Isle, Punica, and the Distorted Isle. Uh, you'd find records saying things like they deceived order and will return when the flames die down, which again could be referencing his own kind, the Hal. They maybe they weren't completely wiped out and maybe they will be returning. And other things that say, uh, and other records which say stuff like the Hal became ash, but they did not disappear. And there's a person in the game story who might be affiliated with the Hal that we've seen. Uh, the Hal, described to be a race of sinners, might actually be represented by Carmine, who is working with the Legion commanders, but may have a different motive in mind. And he treats the adventurer, as well as the Legion commanders, as pawns in his own scheme, and often watches over the adventurer, observing their growth and progress, and finding pieces of the Ark. And even in South Vern, where the player clashes swords with Carmine momentarily, he yields and he kind of lets the player through to the other Legion generals without putting up a fight. And Kadan, who's already uttered the words to not trust the Lazaneth uh, directly to the player, persistently chases after Carmine, considering him to be a great threat to Arcacia. And he's only stopped by, um, well, he's stopped by the likes of Armin. So these events are actually taking place during the great siege of the Legion Generals on South Fern. And you can see that while all of this was happening, there are some independent people that are working as agents for themselves, and they have their own motives and plans during all of this mayhem. 
So that's where Kadan was, and that's why you didn't see him with the lineup. He was looking for something. give you guys the short of that as you guys saw Kadan was looking for something during the events of South Fern and he finds Carmine that's what he utters when he sees Carmine he's like found you and then Carmine tries to make a hasty retreat back to Petrania but Kadan he's very fast on his feet and he goes through the portal before it can close and follows him into Petrania Kadan sees Carmine and whatever his goal is to be a great great threat to Arcacia and he tries to kill Carmine then and there, but he's interrupted by Armin in the last second. We don't actually get to hear what Armin says to Kadan, but what he responds with is, how do you know that? So Armin seems to know something about the truth of the game's world, and that actually gets Kadan to yield and leave. But the man that Armin meets with in that space, the Lazanet, 
he seems to have a plan that somehow aligns with Carmine's, or at least it's not opposing to it. Uh, and their plans may be related to Regulus uh, in some way, shape, or form. And whatever happened back then, when the Lazanets stole the Ark after the Hal stole the Ark, and both of those are the races that have been banished in some way. Beatrice, she is... She must be aware of all of this because she's someone who can see the destiny of the adventurer ahead. Uh, the, she, she already knows what's going to happen. She read the wiki. Yes. <laughs> 그것이 비록 당신이 바라지 않았던 미래라 해도 That scene is actually deeply ominous. Uh, what she says is, yes, the Ark will lead you to your destiny, even though it's the future that you didn't want in a very dismissive manner of voice. So she's very aware of something that's going to happen so the Ark, as we know at this point, is a thing of sacrifice. It's not a thing of, it's not a thing of hope. Uh, a lot of people in the story, it's implied that the Ark will save everyone, but it's uh, it's more or less mentioned by Karan that the Ark is something that will require sacrifice, and that there will have to be a great choice that the player will have to make at some point, maybe by the end of the story, and this choice. It is, it, it, Armin is a very, very key character in this story somehow. The melodies created by Father Armin's memories, let us try to follow them. A village burned to the ground. The tranquil and sorrowful sea. And a lonely boy, deeply scarred, gazing out into the water. Through the raging waves, the boy became a young man. He saved many people, but his scars grew wider and deeper over time. He could sometimes be found in the darkness. Now, he is lost in the deepest darkness he's ever known. But he doesn't belong to the darkness just yet. The memories that dwell within him. The brief moments shared with you. They have become the light that he holds on to. My stupid Do mustache. You believe in him. He's drifted away for now. But one day, his path may rejoin yours. And when that day comes, you will to make a choice. Don't give up. As he wades through the darkness, may you be the source of light at the end.
Actually, the music is pretty good during all that. There are some additional scenes regarding uh, Carmine and Armin. They're basically doing their own thing. Wh whereas the, the you have this entire conflict going on with you looking for the arcs and dealing with the Legion generals, but they're basically just kind of doing their own thing on the side. And we kind of get like snippets of uh, of what Carmine's ambitions are. The Guardians. The ultimate life form created by the gods of chaos and light to protect against total dimensional collapse. They awake once more. Their sole duty is to protect the planet. Five centuries ago, that duty let them decide with the mortals against Master Kazros. But something changed. Now they're attacking mortals. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Don't worry, I know the answer. They're attacking the mortals. Because you are now the greatest threat to Arcasia. Not us. That can't be. Humans are always saying they wish the world would change. But they never think that means changing themselves. Don't you think such hubris is hastening this world's downfall? Well, cling to your beliefs if you must. We have plenty of time and more to see. <laughs> the crimes of humans. Such ugliness. Perhaps more demon like than demons. Let me out. Not everyone's like this. Let me in. <laughs> Oh. These are just the ones who got caught. Wake up. How can you still believe that humans are innately good? Even after watching them slaughtering innocent villagers, begging for mercy? Take a step back and have a clear look at them. You'll finally see the mortals for the beasts they've always been. Hmm. Still don't see it. You always were a bit slow on the uptake. He's calling him stupid. Arvin doesn't flare. Where are we now? This is the reality, or rather, the truth which you seek to avoid. <laughs> what are they doing? These Getting are pirate coins. Sentenced to labor for their crimes. Never mind that most are innocent. Justice means nothing when there's work to be done. That can't be. <laughs> Open your eyes, Armin. How can you defend such monsters? There is still goodness in some. Not much goodness in here. Out. Let's go. This place makes me sick. <laughs> Onward. There is no end to mortals' greed. Take this verdant to your business. <laughs> Yet another silly mortal grasping for godhood. An empty dream, one that always ends in tragedy. And what are you doing about it? <laughs> What's there to be done? Humanity's doom is a foregone conclusion, even without our help. 
I only bring it up to show you the truth. Demons didn't cause this chaos. Mortal ambition is to blame for the erosion of the walls between our worlds. When the rift opens, the red moon shall rise, and our world Petrania will finally shine. So, your plan is to destroy Arcasia? <laughs> Precisely the opposite. I only wish to save this failing world. <laughs> you disagree? But what makes you think that humans, with all their sins, deserve to be masters of the light? <laughs> that bit is actually pretty important because everyone's objective seems to be the primal arc and the light that it creates. And so, you know, we usually associate light with good, but it seems that the demons are like, yeah, well, I want that. Where are we? <sighs> Think of this as where the future is being born. Everything that's happened is a small part of the grand plan. Then why did you bring me here? What are you scheming, demon? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. You can't scheming. just call people a demon. All I've done is open your eyes. The choice was yours all along, wasn't it? You're here. Of your own free will. You and I actually have a lot in common. We don't really belong to either side in this war. We're stuck somewhere in the middle. But I can feel it. The great, inexplicable power within you. That's hot. I have no such thing. <laughs> it will become clear soon to you and to this world I greatly look forward to the future that power will lead us to <laughs> Carmine pretty much props up Armin as being a central key piece of the story of Lost Ark by the way after the events of El Geisha that we're getting in Korea this April, the next story arc actually focus on, focuses on Armin uh, during all these events that will be going on. Where have you taken me? Okay, this is true. Each of these cutscenes is just Armin asking where the hell he is. You know it as the Shade Spire. Its real name... The Pillar of Petrania. Petrania? The Dark Star. Very good. Even Carmine does tower on his alt. You have no excuse. The world created by Zosma, the God of Chaos, currently ruled by Master Kazaros. Once the Pillar of Petrania takes root in Arcasia, it will create a dimensional bridge. Arcasia and Petrania will finally become one. Regulus would never let that happen. Regulus? <laughs> that so-called god you asked to worship? I keep forgetting you are a brainwashed priest. Poor confused Elaine. Where was that great god of yours? 500 years ago when you needed him? Where is he now? How much longer are you going to wait for a god who isn't there? Once the red moon rises, none of this will matter. Then, my plan will finally be complete. Okay, so pretty much the, uh, the, these cutscenes are basically just to tell you that Armin's got some crazy ass ambitions going on and he seems to know more about the truth of the game's world that he's trying to tell Armin. So that, that, that's their whole side story business. Also, a lot of people seem to not very like Regulus very much. You would, I guess, go into a game thinking that, oh, the god of order and, and whatnot is the good guy. But there's a lot of clues that seem to inspire the idea that, 
okay, maybe he's not necessarily good. He's just a god that has a world that likes order, but that doesn't mean that he's a good dude. He might be out there to just kill everybody. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's everything that's going on with them. And then there's also the matter of Feymine and Karan. Uh, we still don't know what their identities are. Darkness had seriously damaged my wings, and I couldn't move. Uh, uh. Mine was channeling his darkness into Elgatia. Mine is a Lance Master main. Nice counter. I wish Nina V would look at me like that. Yeah, so we talked about this before, but they seem to be very, very bitter rivals. Even in the chain war uh, 500 years ago, they squared off against each other and nobody could intervene. They're considered the strongest Legion general uh, and the strongest sidereal. And there seems to be some sort of connection with them. A, a strong theory is that when Zazma was killed and split off to two shards, that one shard was Thamine and the other shard was Kadan. They might be two parts of a whole. And if there's any evidence that supports that, it's a picture which I don't think I even have. Okay, yeah, I forgot to I forgot to take the picture. You can't see it in game. I don't have the picture. I'd, I, I'd have to go and find it. You can't see it in game. But the official artwork of Thaymine shows that underneath his helmet, he's got long silver hair. Thank you. That is your boy Thaymine. What is that? Oh, that seems familiar. But ultimately, we had to figure out what the underlying plot of the story is because there's a very cliche story that's presented in front of us good versus evil a bunch of legion generals bleach already did this before lost ark okay lost ark is just copying bleach okay but besides that story there seems to be a completely different story and to the its credit that smilegate has confirmed that the current story that we have up until the point that we are at right now is about 10 to 15 percent of the total story that is how much we've accomplished in these past three years. So, this month, we have Elgatia, which is presumably where the seventh arc will be located. And it is presumed that once we are able to obtain the seventh arc, there will be a huge twist in the story. A huge, huge twist and surprise, which we'll be looking forward to. But, 
The evidence of the world being a world of a repeating history cannot be denied. There have been clues since season one, even in item tooltips, that would imply that the world has its a specific destiny, and once it reaches that destiny, it loops back to the beginning. And your job as the adventurer is to defy that destiny. In any case, there's also a bunch of clues in game that might imply this. When you meet Shandy and Zinnervale, the first thing that these two NPCs that you have never met prior to this point say to you is that you look familiar. Even though they should have no idea who you are, they say that you look familiar, as if they had met you before in the past. Stella, who you've been farming for her Omnium Star, when she's defeated an Anguished Isle, asks you as you defeat her, are you still playing the hero? When is the last time you actually saved anyone? And in the end, you'll be left all alone in despair, just like me. There are NPCs that seem to speak in a very fourth wall breaking way, way uh, as if they're speaking directly to the player themselves. Lastly, there is a quest uh, some of you guys might have done it, the Land of Truth, which is the one with the um, where you kind of uh, kick Armin off a cliff <laughs> instead of picking him up. At the end, yes, the Land of Truth, at the end of that quest line, the man speaks to you and says, how many users do you think have been here before you? None. No users have ever made it this far. Now farewell as he sends you back into the game. There are people that believe that that guy who speaks to you at the very end of that quest might actually be Lupion himself. And the whole thing is designed by him. Yeah, it's a self-insert of Gold River, pretty much. The whole game is designed to just loop like that. But yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting concept. It's kind of cool because Lost Ark's story on surface level is super cliche and <laughs> pretty boring to be honest. But if they're going so far as to uh, potentially, you know, go for all these underlying plots, it might be slightly more interesting. And the world building doesn't seem all that terrible to be honest. So I at least give it to them that it's not totally cliche and it's interesting enough where we can theory craft these kinds of things. I'm really looking forward to the story uh, and how it'll change tones this upcoming month. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, as I mentioned to you guys, a lot of this is theory crafted stuff. There's actually a YouTube channel that I want to credit uh, as to how I've been following a lot, of, a lot of these stories. It is an excellent, excellent, excellent YouTube channel if you're interested in that kind of thing. Let me link it in chat. I, if you're actually interested in the game story, I would strongly recommend that you give that channel a follow. Most of his videos are in Korean, but he does do English subtitles for some of his topical lore-related things. It's a great, great, great channel for people that are interested in story and lore. Are there subs? Yes. Uh, for the really big videos that talk about story and lore, there are actually English subs for it. And they're very good English subs, might I add. That concludes Lore Arc Part 2. Thank you guys for uh, tuning in. The story, you, you're now prepped with the story to where we are currently. Uh, there is one more cutscene that I will share with you all before we end it. Astelgion은 붕괴됐지만, 다행히 붉은 달의 재료는 수확할 수 있었습니다. 500년 전의 실패를 반복하진 않을 겁니다. 카제로스님.
낙원으로 향할 것입니다. 아, 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 아. I wanted to share that cutscene with you guys because not all of you guys will be able to access that cutscene. That cutscene is only available if you are able to defeat Abrashud in Phase 6. So for those of you guys who may be planning to take the game a bit more casual, you might not have ever seen that cutscene. Uh, but pretty much what's going on in that is uh, Abrashud informs people that Astalgia, or informs Kazaros that while Astalgia has collapsed, she managed to harvest a piece uh, for the creation of a new red moon. And then she says that they will not repeat the failures of 500 years ago. Um, Kazaros feels that his body is starting to loosen in the lava, and they're getting ready to make their great moves, their big moves. Uh, and they cast their attention towards Elgatia. So everything in the past three years is culminating in the update that is happening later this month.